Welcome everybody to uh, one of our uh, Monash Energy Institute uh, webinar series. Um, we've had a few this year, very successful, um, successfully uh, uh, running so far. Uh, I don't know, um, but, uh, people still keep rolling up to these this year across different uh, um, organizations, webinars, you know, even though um, we've been doing webinars a lot, so that's really heartening. So thank you everyone for um, making your evening available to, to us and um, hopefully we will successfully make the time worthwhile. Um, uh, you know, so um, this uh, webinar will run for one hour, about 30 minutes of presentations from our four uh, speakers and the 20 to 30 uh, minutes session, uh, uh, Q&A session. Our um, webinar will be recorded, so um, hopefully that's okay with you. And we're, afterwards, it will be available on the um, on our uh, webinar pages under the Monash Energy Institute uh, site. So, um, uh, Monash Energy Institute is a community of about 175 researchers across a varied area of disciplines, um, focusing on the energy transition and uh, focusing on, on accelerating the energy transition towards sustainable energy starting uh, uh, working across a range of um, sectors including electricity and renewable electricity uh, power supply uh, transport uh, uh, renewable transport and transport electrification industrial processes and new energy storage technologies and materials and looking also at the um, at the uh, uh, social and environment uh, social and uh, political aspect uh, of this transition. And so, um, first of all, then I would like to also acknowledge that uh, we are uh, standing on the lands of the Kulin Nation, um, uh, at least those of us in, in, um, in Melbourne, in, in around Melbourne. And um, I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and express warm welcome to any um, uh, uh, Indigenous uh, folks who are here with us today. So, um, uh, the background to, to this um, presentation is, is, of course, the work we're doing uh, at Monash across uh, the, our, our uh, buildings and property division and our uh, research sector under the banner of the Net Zero initiative uh, and the microgrid uh, initiative within it. So the Net Zero initiative will be something that um, uh, our speak one of our speakers will present later. But now, uh, suffice it to say that uh, we were the first university to announce a um, net zero target by 2030. And I'm happy to say that we, we're well underway to that. And this is, uh, goes together with our research uh, and um, leadership imperatives to show the way forward and show that things can be done. And so th this initiative uh, was, by the way, a joint uh, venture between the Monash Energy Institute or Monash Energy Materials and Systems Institute, as it was called at the time, and uh, the faculties of engineering and IT and, um, and the buildings and property division. Rob Brimblecombe, in particular, from that division, the sustainability leader there, was, was very instrumental in helping kick, the, kick this off. But um, the lesson we learned through that whole process is that for any organization, you need to align things that make uh, environmental and financial sense together with also the um, the key core business aspects of the university and when we were able to show that all these three go together decarbonization um, uh, asset and uh, renewal and energy efficiency and research and teaching that got people excited so that was a, as a good lesson for for uh, others trying to go ahead um, in this direction so um, uh, I will now move on to announce the first speaker. The first speaker is Herman Bubano from Indra Minsaid. And um, Herman is um, a senior IT manager uh, driven to deliver relevant business solutions within Indra. He's been working closely with Monash. He has more than nine years of experience in one of the, one of the top global IT consultancy firms. He has expertise in systems architecture and integration, SDLC, CETRM software, that's uh, energy trading risk management software implementation, IoT and edge computing, and business knowledge in commodities, trading, oil and gas, and electricity. So as you can see, he's got a very diverse background, including also risk management, accounting, and 
financial sectors, smart grids, and renewable energy. So I'll hand over now to Herman to, to uh, talk to us about the load and generation management uh, of the uh, under the Monash microgrid and smart energy city. Take over. Thank you. Thank you, Ariel, for that uh, presentation and that introduction. I'm going to give you a brief introduction of uh, what INDRA is and what role it takes in, in, in this whole microgrid project and, um, and how, how this partnership came, came to be as well, right? So we are, we are part of uh, this project that is a bit, uh, that is a section of the, of, of the Net Zero initiative that Ariel was presenting there so 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 we partner with monash to to deliver this this project which is funded by arena so i'm going to give you a brief introduction of what indra is and uh, and uh, where are we at at the moment all right so indra is a leading and global consult consulting technology company um uh, with uh, 49,000 professionals around around the world it has presence in in 140 countries and and uh, investment in research and development right so recently indra was split into into two different sec sections or business business units uh on the left side you can see indra uh which manages traf traffic and transportation and defense and we have Minsight, which has all the other all, all the other elements including energy and industry which is the branch uh, for which i work right so um uh, we we have a very big presence in, in in energy. Our our solutions are and services are provided to over 500 companies uh, across uh, the globe, and uh, we like to partner with uh, entities like Monash uh, to 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 provide relevance to the industry, right? And uh, specifically here in Australia, it's it's it, it's been a very successful and uh, interesting partnership. So uh, how it came to be? So we we met around 2016 with with uh, with Monash, and uh, next year we started a, a POC in which we implemented uh, our uh, one of our solutions in one of the campuses in 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 Clayton in Melbourne. Um, this POC basically was managing uh, was monitoring and controlling that building. Uh, with the uh, energy objectives, right? So this was done for the purpose of uh, requesting a grant from Marina, uh, which which has been granted as well, and uh, and 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 here and and here we are. This is this is a project that we are delivering at the moment, for which I am the project manager. Um, and all, another important uh, milestone and and relationship and key relationship aspect is the the Grid Innovation Hub, in which we we actively participate with Monash. This was a, um, a Monash initiative to bring together um, industry and academia collaboration to research cutting edge technology and support Australia's energy transition. So, so we are invested in, into the Green Innovation Hub and, and that's a key milestone of, milestone of our partnership. So <clears throat> this is a little bit about the Smart Energy City project. And uh, what do we have in the campus? What you see on the background is, is uh, a, a 3D map of, of, of the campus and uh, highlighting some of the aspects that, that, that it has. But the relevant thing in here is, is what we are controlling or what we are um, integrating into, into the smart energy city platform itself, right? So we have, um, we have uh, 20 buildings, which amount to 3.5 megawatt of, of load, uh, for which uh, we are um, doing a standardization of different brand of BMSs uh, using uh, a JST and a standard that's called hay Haystack, right? Um, this, this, the platform is providing the ability to manage the flexibility uh, with predefined strategies uh, per building. Uh, we also are providing ability to control to control per building, per zone, per equipment within the building. Uh, this has served for for some behavioral studies um, because we have different types of loads and and flexibility, right? So so in in those across these twenty buildings, we've got gyms, pools, residential, commercials, we, 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 which um, allows us to to have a variety 
of, of aspects to investigate and to and to work with right so this simulates uh, a small a small city right so this is the the Clayton campus move, moves uh, around uh, uh, 10,000 people daily so so well, when it when it was when it when it wasn't locked down right so so uh, it it simulates uh, a small city and uh, it's a perfect laboratory for 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 studying this kind of technologies right so going to the next one we also have um solar solar pv installed across the campus for which we are installing uh, uh, we are integrating eight systems which amount for, for about one megawatt of capacity uh, we are providing direct integration with the cluster controllers that manage all, all these panels um, one of the key aspects of, of, of the solar PV in, in integration is that they're considered grid, grid assets, right? So each one of the devices, uh, each one of the solar systems has each, uh, its own edge device. We're going to see a little bit later what I'm referring to, but, but uh, just ha have in mind that uh, these, these systems behave as a, a, are going to behave as grid assets and not, not building assets, right? Uh, we have the capability to manage uh, active and reactive uh, power control. And uh, we're also providing localized uh, calculated solar power uh, output forecasts based on 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 the on on that particular localization. And uh, one of the most important elements that we have is the one megawatt hour uh, energy storage system, which is composed, which is a hybrid system composed of two different systems: on vanadium 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 flow and a lithium ion. Uh, which as well are going to be considered grid, grid assets. They're going to be used for power quality and energy management, uh, managed manage via, via priorities, right? Uh, essentially, power quality will have uh, highest priority than energy management. Um, but the idea is to have a system that can uh, integrate both, both aspects of, 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 of the, this energy management, giving power quality priority right um, so this is the main asset that provides um, flexibility in, 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 in the campus and uh, it's, it, it will be considered to participate in FCAS and demand response markets and um, <clears throat> in the, the the next one that we have here is uh, the energy storage uh, which will be integrated as well so we have sorry energy storage not, not energy storage this is this is wrong uh it is ev chargers right so we are going we're going to integrate a couple of ev chargers as well that, that are on the campus and and test with them the the, the capability to provide flexibility with with these ev chargers once we have a car a car connected and uh and people opt opt in to this to this kind of services right so so this um these EV chargers will, will provide flexibility when, when they can. The idea is that people, when, when, when they join, they plug in the car, they, they, they participate in the, in, the, in the flexibility market and, and, and are able to, to maybe, maybe get some incentive from, from their participation on, on, the, on, on, the, on, the, on the flexibility market. Well, um, to move on, uh, a little bit of, of our architecture, how, how we've lay, laid this out uh, in this conceptual architecture of the Monash Smart Grid. Um, we've, uh, we've specified three different layers, right? So on the bottom part, we've got uh, DR integration. On the middle, we'll have active grid management. And then on the, on the top, we'll have uh, smart, smart energy management. So um, I, will, I will talk to you uh, briefly about the two Bottom layers, DR integration and active grid management, um, and then my colleague Amelia will will take you over over the smart energy management, which is a, a, a bit a bit more interesting. But bear with me there. All right. So on the DR integration layer, uh, we've got um, how we are integrating with our DRs, right? So so we've we've set a layer, an edge layer, uh, powered by these devices that you see in here. So these are industrial IoT devices, which plug in directly to our batteries, to our solar solar systems, to our EV chargers, and provide us an, 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 edge, an edge capability. Uh, and this means 
capability to do certain and run certain algorithms and run certain certain um, processes right on the edge where the data is closer uh, without having to go through 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 a network right so so this 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 layer is integrated with a with a 4G communication. We did it this way because we wanted to have replicability of this system, right? So we wanted we we wanted this we want to take this system and be able to place it somewhere else where 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 probably our fiber optics are, are are not are not delayed. So we are not deployed. So so we wanted to test 4G comms for communications for for this sort of of, of scenarios. Uh, so all these devices have. Uh, uh, um, a 4G modem, and, and that, that, that's how they that's uh, how they communicate. These are loaded with our with our platform, which is called Edge Number One platform, uh, uh, which allows uh, allows us to run different different. It's a containerized platform that allows us to run different uh, functions right right on the edge, right? So so uh, that's the main thing. So the transactive energy market will be running in here. Uh, using uh, um, uh, making use of making use of, of the platform, right? So it's service service enables architecture to allow the execution of different uh, functionalities. Uh, so we've deployed in this layer. We've deployed around uh, 32 devices um, around the cap campus, which are capturing around uh, 40 24,000 data points every minute and uh, one 1.5 million data points every hour, right? So we are Getting this data real time, or as real time as we can, uh, from from our DERs uh, to have the the, the the biggest visibility that that, that we can. Um, all right. So moving 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 on, the next the next layer is the active grid management. So this is a more centralized layer uh, of 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 the system of of the full system, and uh, it, it provides us two key things, right? So real-time visualization and warnings which is uh not sure if you can see my pointer but uh the, this this layer here and then we've got the power quality management the power quality management is done in this way cent centralized way at the at the moment um to uh this uh, so this layer communicates um f with from uh, with the edge devices and um we are able to visualize their data in real time and, and, and manage and control the grid, right? So uh, remember Prism, uh, Prism is another one of our products that, that, that's deployed here. Uh, it's uh, managing the power quality of, of, of the system, ma making sure that uh, the, power, the power quality parameters are, are within range, right? So, and uh, the other important bit is the, the visualization of the real time data and warnings for which one we're using one side of operational intelligence um to which which allows us to create a powerful visualization dashboards uh, uh to uh, uh, analyze the data it, it has an analytics component um and, and we can see what's happening at the grid in real time right so so this is one of the uses that that, that we're giving the real time data uh creating these uh, visualization dashboards uh to um Provide a better view of what's happening on 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 the grid, and uh, this is this is it from me. Thanks for listening. Um, I'll pass on to Ariel again. Thanks. Thank you very much, Yaman. Um, I'll turn my camera on for a bit. So yeah, that was a very uh, deep dive, very sophisticated technology that. Uh, Indra is helping us uh, build at Monash. So um, and it's been a long journey. Uh, we first met Indra about four years ago at a conference, I guess it was four, maybe maybe even longer. And um, you know, we've, we got together and uh, this this is uh, the result. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's it's worth investing in long-term relationships. I think that's, that's the lesson. So now we have um, the next speaker. The next speaker is, is um, Amya Dixit. And uh, Amir is um, working uh, within the Monash e research um, division and uh, working deployed within this transactive energy management project that's part of the, uh, the uh, Indra Arena uh, funded um, project here. And so he has uh, over nine years of experience in data engineering, software development systems 
integration and across various areas of energy industry, such as retail distribution, metering, billing, financial accounting, and customer service. So take it away, Amir. Thank you. I'm Amir Dixit. Uh, I'll be presenting the transactive energy management solution we are deploying uh, on the Monash microgrid. Uh, so as Haman just explained, uh, uh, Monash microgrid represents a miniature city, essentially, uh, which can, uh, which has multiple, sorry, which has multiple assets deployed on it, uh, which are principal buildings, solar arrays, energy storage, and EV charges. And this uh, uh, microgrid has to provide uh, supply demand services, and uh, it has to, uh, it has to uh, manage, manage its own uh, capacity of generating and consuming energy behind the single connection point with the broader uh, area network of uh, electricity. So uh, the DR integration and active grid management uh, layers, which uh, Haman just spoke about, those are enabling layers for smart energy management to come into picture. So, uh, so smart energy management doesn't, uh, concern, uh, it doesn't, need to concern, doesn't need to be concerned about uh, the power quality aspects, or it doesn't need to worry about safe offer, uh, safe operation of the grid because power power quality takes precedence over uh, smart energy signals. Uh, what smart energy management does is it aggregates the capacity of each DR to flex or uh, uh, to change its demand or supply up and down. Uh, it can aggregate uh, those uh, flexibility aspects. It can and then it can plan the consumption or generation. Uh, based on internal and external constraints, and then it then it can issue uh, commands or or it can orchestrate these DERs. So to put it, to put uh, smart energy management into context, uh, it sits uh, sits between uh, flexible DERs and uh, transactive energy aspects. So uh, flexible DERs are uh, uh, like we mentioned before, uh, smart buildings, uh, solar arrays, batteries, or other types of energy resources. Uh, who can offer uh, flexibility as a service? Uh, what smart energy management does is it it can uh, it can uh, it has a visibility to uh, what constraints are available or are applied on smart transactive side, which I'll come to uh, in a few minutes. So uh, so transactive energy has a few goals like tariff optimization, uh, demand response, etc. Uh, then what smart energy management can do is it can aggregate all the flexibilities and then prepare a plan for orchestration of these DERs at real time. Uh, so it can also, it can either do a uh, day ahead or uh, advanced planning of uh, the microgrid and, or it can do uh, uh, spot uh, planning as well in case of change in uh, the demand or supply. Um, before uh, we, Talk about transactive uh, energy. Uh, let's let me quickly elaborate uh, more on what I mean by flexibility. Um, so, the transactive energy or the energy management solution interacts with the uh, the DERs through a common interface uh, to get uh, the forecast of demand or supply, or to issue uh, uh, control commands uh, to the DERs. Now, this forecast is. Uh, a bit more complicated than a typical uh, demand or supply forecast. Uh, what, what flexibility is basically an ability of a DR to change its uh, consumption or generation up and down from its baseline. So uh, naturally it goes into uh, the areas of machine learning and artificial intelligence. So uh, we are working closely with uh, researchers from our department of IT uh, to build tools around it. Uh, but once we have the, have that forecast, a reliable flexibility forecast, uh, then the task of uh, or the process of uh, energy management becomes uh, much simpler. So uh, what flex, uh, what energy management then can do is uh, get that forecast and then uh, use that forecast or that flexibility forecast as a service to then uh, uh, serve as an interface to the transactive layer of the solution. Uh, so let me then move on to the transactive uh, aspect of uh, this energy energy management solution. So this uh, energy, uh, there are two things to remember. Uh, this energy management solution uh, is uh, a generic platform we are developing to enable uh, research into this area. But 
uh, the transactive energy uh, market is an implementation of that platform, which can also provide, uh, which is actually designed as a solution to the Monash microgrid. So, and another thing to remember is uh, uh, when we say we are uh, uh, controlling DERs, we are not trying, we are not trying to uh, direct them or deviate them from their uh, primary goal or primary uh, objective. Uh, for example, a building, a flexible building has primary objective to uh, provide a comfortable environment for its occupants or uh, human occupants. Uh, so we're not trying to change that. What we are trying to do is we are, uh, we are trying to use that building's ability to change its consumption uh, up and down uh, for a period of time so that uh, that can be used as a uh, so basically imagine the building being used as uh, used as a thermal storage basically uh, so uh, now once we move into the transactive energy area uh, each dr has a transactive agent so what transactive agent does is it takes the flexibility forecast from the dr and then it also takes account uh, takes into account the preferences of the users for example a building manager uh, uh, may have maximum or minimum thresholds for the temperature, uh, uh, which makes the human occupants happy, or, or that they don't they don't complain about complain about it. So uh, once the uh, once uh, so these preferences can be pre-configured by a building manager, or uh, and then uh, once these preferences and flexibility are considered together, then transactive energy uh, transactive agent is uh, in a position to represent that particular DR in a uh, transactive energy market and on the other other side of uh, this solution we have transactive uh, energy market the market application itself which can be instantiated based on uh, or invoked based on external uh, requests for example uh, reducing the demand of uh, overall demand uh, demand of the microgrid or it can be uh, an internal requester uh, trying to manage uh, peak demand for example so once once this uh, transactive energy market is uh, in, in initiated, uh, the objective of the market is to uh, uh, enable uh, the trade of energy. So when I say energy, the trade of uh, flexibility within the market uh, to uh, uh, in order to achieve its uh, overall goal. Uh, in exchange, the DR also gets some incentive. So it could be a financial incentive, a financial incentive to provide flexibility, or could be uh, something more abstract. So that's the whole idea of transactive energy. Uh, let's have a uh, quick look at uh, how uh, the technology is actually deployed. Uh, so as you can see on the left-hand side, uh, 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 the transactive energy applications or uh, transactive energy management applications are deployed uh, uh, alongside uh, Indra's technology stack. So all these uh, on the left-hand side, whatever lines you see, those are uh, containers, deployed on uh, the hardware uh, uh, Haman showed you earlier, that's the edge device. And these containers talk to each other via MQTT protocol. Uh, but we do, uh, some of the applications don't need to be on the edge. For example, the market can be uh, invoked on the cloud. It doesn't, it can be cloud native. It doesn't need to reside on any particular DR. So those applications can reside on the cloud. Uh, and uh, some of the Indra technology like uh, centralized uh, power quality management system is also uh, centrally located in the cloud. And uh, in order to communicate uh, between these two components of the technology, we have multiple uh, data and message buses. So Indra is using uh, their high speed solution. We have RabbitMQ. Uh, uh, there is another interesting aspect to this is a distributed ledger based on uh, Holochain technology. So whatever transactions are taking place uh, within this microgrid, uh, it could be the commitments made by the DER to meet certain demand, or it could be the request sent by the market to meet certain objectives. So all those transactions can be recorded in a distributed ledger. So that distributed ledger is a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, communication ledger, uh, which uh, uh, it, it's, it works similar to traditional blockchain, but it's slightly different to a blockchain solution. So that, that's an interesting aspect. And then we are trying to explore whether we can also use this uh, ledger to as, as a message bus between our uh, different applications. So that's current work in progress. Um, obviously, uh, this is a very uh, new uh, idea and it has uh, never been implemented in a, in a uh, large grid. So 
uh, there are a number of challenges to be addressed. For example, uh, one of the key aspects is a behavior, human behavior, or how it affects the flexibility and how flexibility affects the users or the people. So we are uh, engaging with uh, uh, relevant researchers from the Monash University. Uh, yeah, we are working with Indra obviously to uh, address challenges around DR integration. Uh, the tra transactive energy management as a solution uh, adds value if it's supported by a equivalent uh, commercial or operational model. Uh, so th th there is a team working on that as well. Um, but it's hard to uh, implement or test these models on a real grid in a city, for example. So that's why this uh, Monash microgrid or the transactive energy management solution we, have, we are developing provides a test bed to test out uh, different operational models and uh, then uh, uh, learn from those uh, experiments. Uh, and uh, uh, what uh, Haman showed you earlier, the power quality and uh, uh, the power quality solution or the FCAS or ancillary services solution, that's currently centralized, but uh, we are also uh, looking into uh, whether uh, this platform can be extended to provide microgrid services like ancillary services uh, in a decentralized way. So that's it from me. Uh, back to Ariel. Thank you. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Amir. Right on time. And um, I think uh, I will leave the, any major comments for Q&A, but I think the, the, the main thing to, to note here is how complex it is when you actually take these these ideas that people sometimes a little bit uh, frivolously throw around out there in, in, um, in the community saying, oh yeah, we'll just deploy a VPP and do all this stuff, you know, and it'll just sort of work. Well, it doesn't just work. You need to integrate a lot of things from the ground up. And that's uh, what, what I think is very important about what we're doing. So, so now we have our next speaker, uh, Reza Razaghi. And uh, Reza is uh, one of my close colleagues from uh, Electrical and Computer Systems Engineering in the Faculty of IT. We work together on a few projects and um, this is, uh, we work to combine engineering, computer science, AI and uh, other fields. And his research group is particularly interested in integration of distributed energy resources and power networks, real-time monitoring and situational awareness, and power line related bushfire mitigation techniques, uh, amongst many things. Um, his extensive research on advanced fog location methods has resulted in a commercialization patent. He has been the recipient of multiple prestigious awards, including the 2019 Best Paper Award of the IEEE Transactions on Electromagnetic Compatibility amongst other awards. So I'll hand over now without further ado to Reza Razaghi. My presentation will be about real-time monitoring and the role of new sensors in smart grids and in microgrids. Uh, and uh, to give a little bit context why we need this real-time monitoring, uh, this is a slide I usually use in my lectures because it uh, shows nicely the structure of our network. So here we've got the generation units uh, the transmission network, sub-transmission, distribution, and the low voltage distribution networks. And in conventional power networks, uh, as we know, uh, we had large scale power plants generating power, and we had one way power flow to our consumers, typically at the bottom of the grid at the distribution level. In this sorts of grid, uh, the main source of uncertainty was coming from loads. And the way network operator, they were managing this uncertainty was using long-term forecasting and planning and short-term dispatch. But what's happening now is uh, we know we are adding distributed energy resources uh, at different levels of the network, in particular at uh, lower levels of the distribution network. And uh, these uh, distributed energy resources, most of them that are based on renewable energy uh, sources such as wind and solar, and they're volatile. So adding new generation units, it also adds uh, new sources of uncertainty in the network, uh, which is quite different uh, than the uh, dynamics of the load. And this means the operational tools and control tools we were using for conventional power networks might not be sufficient for such active grids. And we would need to have more real-time actions 
And to have real-time control, uh, first we need to have a real-time visibility to know what's happening in the grid. So this is the motivation why we need real-time monitoring and why we need new types of sensors. Uh, in fact, this is a very well-known uh, concern and challenge by network operators. Uh, in 2017, AMO published a, a report uh, acknowledging that the lack of visibility could undermine the ability to manage the grid. And uh, in active distribution networks, network operators are seeking new ways to enhance the visibility uh, to have a better control on the grid and also on the DERs. And to achieve this visibility, uh, we need enablers and we need technologies, uh, measurement devices to provide data. Let's have a look on the evolution of the uh, metering technology we've got in power network. So we started this analog meters, we still use them. So they are pretty good, but they have some limited precision and very limited connectivity. Then uh, we uh, end up using SCADA or RTS. So with the SCADA, we can achieve uh, measurements uh, in the range of few seconds with a better precision, but still not enough uh, to have real-time monitoring and to enable real-time control. And that brings us to the most state-of-the-art uh, monitoring technology for power networks uh, called phaser measurement units or PMUs, uh, which provide distinct advantages uh, like very high resolution of uh, more frequent data compared to SCADA or analog meters. And the another particular uh, important advantage is uh, here, the measurements are all time synchronized and time stamped. And I'll show you why this time synchronization is important. Uh, so the first advantage, as I said, was uh, more frequent measurements. So this is a uh, graph uh, voltage measurement after a disturbance in power network measured by scatter system in the blue one and red one by PMUs. So with the scatter system, we can achieve a uh, resolution of a few seconds, like four seconds, um, uh, one measurement per four seconds. But with PMUs, we can achieve like probably 50, 100 uh, measurements per second. And that's the reason we can see all this uh, dynamics, which are valuable to understand what's happening in the grid and to develop some uh, actions like control actions or protection actions uh, for this uh, type of dynamic events. And the second advantage uh, for PMUs is uh, measurements are time synchronized, uh, typically using GPS. And using this time synchronization, we can define phaser and we can define synchrophaser. Here, if you are not a power engineer, so in power networks, uh, we typically use sinusoidal signals. Uh, for a sinusoidal signal, we can define frequency, amplitude, and the phase angle. And this time domain signal can be viewed in complex domain with a vector. And with PMUs, thanks to the time synchronization, we can measure the phase angle of this vector. And using this phase angle at different locations, we can define new uh, 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 operational and control tools. How we do that, so uh, in a network, we would need multiple of PMUs. Uh, at different locations. Uh, they are all synchronized to one common time source, typically, as I said, by GPS. And then we collect the data uh, from these PMUs. Uh, these data usually are called uh, uh, synchrophasers in a phaser data concentrator. And then we define our monitoring uh, pr protection or control uh, functionalities. Uh, here, I'll give you just one example, uh, which is the work uh, one of our PhD students did. Uh, which it's about the control of frequency in low inertia power networks. And the reason I have this example in this uh, presentation is because this is an important problem now also in Australia uh, and in countries where we have a low inertia problem. So when we are replacing synchronous generators with wind and solar, the amount of available inertia, synchronous inertia in the network is decreasing and that can cause troubles uh, to control frequency. So in this study, uh, Diane, our PhD student, he simulated uh, Australian power grid in our real-time simulator. And then we used P a PMU, which was synchronized to uh, uh, UTC time of GPS. And then what he did was he developed a, a, a control algorithm for battery storage system to arrest frequency after a deviation and restore it quickly, much quickly and more efficient than conventional droop-based control methods. So this on the right side, what you are seeing is uh, 
frequency uh, uh, response uh, when we disconnect a 200 megawatt generator and we are comparing the result of this controller, the orange one with the conventional group, which is red one. So we are able to first arrest the frequency quickly and also restore it quickly. Uh, this is only one of the functionalities uh, we can uh, do with PMUs, but we are doing more interesting applications in our campus now in the, we are in the process of deploying number of PMUs in our microgrid in Clayton campus. And in parallel, we are also developing a data hosting platform to uh, host the synchrophases from PMUs uh, on edge and also on the cloud. And we are developing some machine learning algorithms for situational awareness and anomaly detection. That's all for me. Uh, over to you, Ariel. Fantastic. So, so thank you very much, Reza. And I'll, um, in the interest of time, we'll uh, go straight through to the next speaker, my uh, colleague from the Faculty of IT, Dr. Sarah Goodwin, who's a lecturer in with Monash and Immersive Analytics, and uh, uh, specifically, specifically within the Immersive Analytics Lab. Um, Sarah's uh, research focuses on innovative and creative visual analytics for complex multidimensional and geospatial data sets with a uh, big focus on energy systems visualization. She has uh, 15 years of academic and professional experience in geospatial analysis and information visualization and has worked as a GIS technician, geodata analyst, consultant and academic researcher for some of the leading research centers around the world in this space. Um, her current research focuses on any data visualization and um, Sarah is also um, deputy theme lead of the energy sustainable energy theme within the faculty of IT and she has led many projects and has worked with many uh, industry partners uh, of Monash and the Monash Grid Innovation Hub. So please Sarah, your, your turn. Yes. Hi everyone, uh, thanks Ariel for the introduction. Um, so um, my, my visualization uh, here is uh, pretty boring on a, on a white bit of paper. Um, one of the things that I want to emphasize is that all these different concepts that you've just heard about from all our different um, speakers today, they, they, they're, they're complex. And um, one of the things that we really need to, to work on is how, how do we um, visually communicate that data and how do we um, understand some of the concepts uh, going on and how do we um, you know, present the findings that we have. And um, my work uh, this year has been uh, particularly looking at, at um, and working with everyone in this team, as well as others um, in a wider capacity about how we might visualize that data and it's ongoing. So here are some, um, just some examples of, of what we've done. Um, uh, I work in the Immersive Analytics Lab. Um, this is in the Human Centered Computing uh, Group, where we particularly try and understand uh, what it is that people are trying to, uh, to visualize and, and try and uh, visualize this in, in new ways and novel ways. Um, so here are a few of our, our projects. There's me in the background from a few years ago. Uh, but we're, a lot of it's about immersive environments, but it's also just generally about uh, visualizing complex data and, and trying to help people um, understand it. So from, a, from a, the microgrid, um, what is it that we're trying to visualize? Well, there's lots of different types of data. That could be the consumption data. It could be what's coming out the sensors, uh, the, the link to temperature, forecast, uh, flexibility. Uh, this incorporates the spatial data, but also the temporal data, the, the real time or historical data and how we might um, visually communicate that. And in particular, the reasons why we need to be able to do this is that it helps us explore the data, it helps us analyze it, um, helps us understand are there any anomalies of so um, it's not just for maintenance and operations, but also um, to see where we might improve what we might want to um, do, um, what we might need to bring more in of and, um, and just exp explain the concepts uh, and communicate this to our partners. Um, and the oh, how do I go back. Can't go back. Uh, let me find. Sorry about that. Um, so, how we might do this? Uh, there's loads of different techniques. Uh, some of the ones you've seen today already. Um, uh, I'm just going to talk about some of these um, where we're trying to design uh, maybe visualizations that haven't been designed before um, and using new concepts. Um, first of all, um, here's a design of a dashboard. Uh, dashboards are pretty 
typical uh, concepts in, in this area where we're trying to visualize the information and try to help people understand it. And it's quite often uh, for real time use. Uh, but also for historical data. This in particular, we're looking um, at a project uh, where we're trying to um, conceptualize the, what it is that the building managers might need to, to understand. So um, not only the, the consumption of their building, but how it compares to others in the microgrid um, and how that compares to the kind of solar generation or the battery storage storage and how their, um, how their buildings uh, maintenance and, and management within that microgrid could um, affect uh, or their use could affect um, other people's use and, and be able to collaboratively collaborate um, and understand how their um, their building uh, fits in uh, with the wider picture. Um, here are a few concept designs that we've been looking at. Uh, so things like weather and solar, solar power um, and how the, the uh, consumption compares to, to last week or last month, but also incorporating the weather and trying to um, embed that in our understanding. Uh, as part of that is also um, event based uh, and uh, event uh, where events might occur. So um, we might, for example, have a very high, high um, weather forecast for a particular day. There's expected a, a, a peak in, in the microgrid. So um, how might we um, conceptualize how we might want to visualize that and see how that building performs relating to others. These are all just ideas and designs, and so they haven't been um, haven't been implemented yet. Um, but they're uh, trying to help us uh, think about what might be implemented going forward. Um, talking about flexibility, also uh, buildings uh, are different. Each building and each room are quite different from others. So how we might visualize that would be could potentially with building floor plans and uh, thinking about how how flexible that building uh, that room is or that that floor is in comparison to others. So it's quite a, an easy one to start with. Um, but the idea, or the, I suppose the um, concept of a microgrid uh, was also one that a lot of people don't understand. So those who are um, within Monash um, also trying to communicate what, what the data we're uh, collecting and how we might be presenting that. Um, so this is a project um, from a student of mine who um, was uh, trying to visualize the, the concept and trying to um, really try and think about what concepts um, and talk to some of the, the people who are um, involved in this project. Uh, so talking to stakeholders, really trying to understand what it is they're trying to communicate um, and thinking about how those could be visualized. Um, so in particular, we, um, she was looking at how that could be visualized on a large screen display because in the future control room, which is in our Clayton campus, we have this huge um, screen display here. So we were really interested to how we could use that more effectively to, to present the microgrid. Um, so she did some mock-up designs about how it, and, and started to collect the data and started to understand the microgrid. Here we've got two different, it's not using the full display, it's using two different types because 3D uh, it looks good, it's quite useful, uh, but 2D is sometimes easier to understand. Um, so we're looking at how those compare and how they're different. Um, she's got a little video here. So um, here's the future control room. I'm not going to play the whole video, um, but if I, yeah, so here's uh, her designs and then in uh, in the uh, little map design here is the 20 buildings that are all connected to this ring uh, these are the what's connected in the microgrid so far as you heard earlier um, about some of the concepts um, each of the buildings some of them have uh, solar panels on the roof the different uh, the darkness of the panels indicates um, how, how, what the capacity of that solar, solar panels are uh, on top of the building we've got a couple of batteries so there's a battery over here the green one uh, these buildings, the flat ones, haven't been finished or, or hadn't been finished when she created this mock-up. Uh, there's the network, uh, electrical network underneath uh, and the substations um, linked on the, on the network uh, and you can interact with the map and, and explore it. Um, and uh, if I keep going forward, the, the, um, the concept of how, so things like how can I um, measure the distance between the buildings was added. Um, and started to explore looking at how different buildings compare to each other. So looking at the energy consumption uh, and the height of those buildings and what is contained within them. Um, so that's, that was her project, great little project to, to get started. 
And um, then finally, uh, and another project that I've been working on, so actually links quite, quite nicely to hers was um, where we were actually using a tabletop display. So rather than in, in, the, in the future control room where we have these huge displays, actually getting people around the table and collaborating and exploring the data in a much more collaborative form uh, and embedding technology such as uh, tangible objects. So these are um, 3D printed buildings and um, AR um, headsets. So I'm going to uh, now play a video from a colleague of mine that hopefully you can hear. Let me know, Ariel, if you can't hear it. We present Uplift, a system that supports casual collaborative visual analytics in the domain of smart grid technology. We applied a co-design approach to design, implement, and evaluate Uplift with experts in energy systems and members of the Monash mm -hmm. Microgrid project. Results of initial interviews and an elicitation <laughs> workshop led to core design criteria for supporting collaborative discussions between various experts. So in particular, uh, while we were discussing this with the stakeholders, one of the things that was um, seemed to be difficult was um, everyone was using different tools, everyone was collaborate, uh, doing their own work on different um, different computers, the data is separate, and it was really difficult to, to kind of have those conversations where um, there was an object um, where they could talk to. Um, so this is partly why we had this kind of walk up and, and use aspects, but it had to be easy and it had to be a, a low te technical barrier to entry. To provide an engaging centerpiece for collaboration and knowledge sharing, Uplift integrates several technologies, the tabletop display, Tracked tangible widgets, head worn augmented reality displays, and a large display backdrop. The table holds a physical model of the Monash campus. Users can select different base maps to be shown on the tabletop surface. Uplift uses embedded data visualization to show energy data for each campus building. To identify patterns, users can drill down in time with a tangible widget from yearly through hourly granularity. Changes in the chosen time frame are animated using the handheld time You have slide. to use um, sliders and things made of Lego in, in academic work. Lifting up the time slider reveals a snapshot of time through space time cube visualization. Energy data are shown above each building in a series of time slices. Picking up a building widget shows details on demand about energy use within the building. Other data are situated in space above or around the tabletop. Here we see bars representing solar power generation from cells located on each building. The selected time point is shown on a 2D chart of weather data displayed behind the tabletop. Multiple feedback sessions with experts in our co-design process provided several potential use cases and future opportunities for uplift. So there we go. So there's lots more projects to do, <laughs> lots more concepts to, 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 to work on, uh, loads of data to present. And there's just a kind of snapshot of the work that we've been doing, um, trying, to, trying to visualize the data in lots of different ways for lots of different types of users, um, using lots of types of technology. That's it, thank you. Fantastic, I think, um, we finished up with the most uh, visually compelling and uh, sort of exciting part, if I may say so. So I think um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad uh, it was it was worth the wait. Anyway, thank you, Sarah. Um, and uh, but there's plenty more work to do in this space to to connect more of the technical detail, the the human behaviour, to the visualisations and other um, data representation work. So um, uh, we very close to time but um i, I might um take the liberty to keep the q a going for another five or ten minutes uh, hopefully uh, the panelists don't mind too much um if you have to go just let me know and, and you go that that's okay but uh, you know people are welcome to stay in the audience and ask some more questions uh, we, we answered a few of those uh, uh while we were there so anyway thank you very much uh, sarah reza Amia and uh, Herman, I think uh, there was a, a wealth of information and um, 
I'm biased in saying that it's very exciting that uh, that we're doing this, and uh, I do believe it's a it's a it's a national, if not world leading uh, project here and, and of, of global significance in that, you know, we can't actually make the transition to uh, a renewable energy um, uh, system, uh, not completely distributed, obviously, there, there's the main grid as well that will be integrated with it. So we can't do that without actually making, solving some of these problems first uh, at mass scale. It's kind of scary, but also, um, Heightening that we're working on it. So, um, yeah, look, I'll hand it over to to, to a, a Q and A session. Um, I'm pretty sure the first uh, question is uh, rhetorical. Um, somebody was asking about someone else attending. Uh, I'm not sure if everyone can see that. Um, so there is um, there's an interesting question um, at the moment. That don't seem to be too many questions. So I wonder if we can enable John Roberts to to ask his question. Uh, that's remaining um, verbally. We've got three questions at the moment. Um, uh, is that a possible, Nancy? Uh, yes, working on it. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Good afternoon. It's uh, John Roberts. I'm uh, a Monash. Uh, uh, data communications engineer working for the eSolutions group and um, I've been, uh, how do you say, tightly involved with uh, uh, integrating um, uh, SMA solar controllers, inverters, um, building automation systems and uh, other sorts of uh, uh, buildings and properties division uh, groups, um, uh, IOTs and, and other arrangements. So um, <laughs> I'm sort of, how do you say, um, part of the implementation process to actually get a lot of this uh, communications equipment on our um, uh, routed IP uh, network, such that uh, things like our SMA controllers can um, uh, send data to uh, web portals uh, onshore, or offshore, and so on and so on and so forth. But of course, getting back to the uh, initial question, um, considering um, uh, the original project implementation, uh, uh, was uh, integrated with a lot of um, uh, structure around uh, the interior buildings, data communication systems, which weren't on UPSs. I see that we've gone to um, a cellular topology. Um, I, I guess when we do demand management and, um, and so forth and work out grid tolerance and allowances, um, the, the aspects of holding up the uh, um, IoT devices that actually uh, communicate from cellular to Ethernet to either trip, trigger, load, shed, um, the switchboard metering circuits, um, or bi-directional communications to actually see what the, is cooking. I'm just trying to understand how we can balance buildings across three different ring mains on three different 22 kV substations with two different wholesalers. I think one of them's a linter and one of them's um, Gemini. It's gone just in the interest of time. Can, yep. can we get, get to the yeah. question? So I guess how, how have we worked out how um, we can balance across two different uh, wholesaler providers. Um, I guess that's my question, you know, it, because they're both doing their own demand management, their own shedding management and their own isolation yeah. management. So how, how have we worked out how our whole of campus system is split to cater for two different wholesalers? That's it. Who wants to take that one? So, so I, well, I might not be able to completely answer answer that one, but uh, I can say a couple of things, right? So one is, well, at the moment the system, probably that, those, are, those are the things that we need to understand throughout the process of the project. The system is only deployed at the, in, in, in one of the rings, in ring three. Um, and uh, and uh, I, I know the Monash project team is working closely with the retailers, right? So this, uh, there's a collaboration in place. Um, to, to work closely with the with the retailers uh, to to be able to manage what, what you're saying right so to, to, to be able to receive signals from them to orchestrate things 
uh, in conjunction with them, right? So, so that's that, 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 that's part of it. And but but I think the answer will come down the track for for what you're saying into in, what, once we get more into in, into testing, uh, which is going to be next year, uh, to understand what, what are the challenges in that in that areas. Fantastic. Thank, thanks, Gaman. Um, we'll move on. Uh, we have, uh, I'm not sure, Adam, if you have a question anymore, it's got answered. Maybe I'll go to um, to uh, um, Wendy's question. Uh, we, we can answer um, in type. And uh, Mohsen Arzani, maybe I'll just read these out now in the interest of time. Um, how does the wind farm contribute to the frequency control on an island with microgrid and in the grid connected operation mode of a microgrid with a hundred with ten percent load disconnection? Um, so I think uh, Reza, can you infer roughly what what the right way to answer this one is? Trying to understand the question. Uh... Yeah, well, maybe the, like Mossen, can can we get Mossen on the on the phone, so to speak, and we can ask. Um, Explain this question a little bit. Nancy, working on it. Sorry, uh, can you repeat? Uh, uh, we'll put Mosen on the um, on the phone uh, on the on the audio. It was my request. Uh, Mosen. Um, uh, Arzani, oh. he asked. Uh, Arzani. Yeah. Yep, perfect. Yeah, Mosen, uh, would you like to repeat your question? You're on mute, so you need to unmute yourself. No? Uh, okay. We'll, we'll go on to the next question from uh, Chloe Monroe. Um, so Chloe is saying she's looking forward to seeing different business models for sharing the benefits of, benefits of DR orchestration and for rewarding desired behaviors by building occupants um can you say what options do you have in mind to explore um did, did you want to elaborate on that a bit chloe well only, only if it doesn't make sense and, and thanks I, I found that really interesting and so lots of the sort of concepts that i'm really keen on in the presentations but you know in the end um i guess i'm interested in removing some of the constraints like if there's a constraint about how a building is operated well what would it take to get that building to be operated in a way that's more congruent with you know the objective of, re of reduced emissions or an economic objective or both you know which is the normal thing that you have multiple objectives that you're trying to reconcile uh, so I'm interested in well how, how does this get from solving a lot of these technical problems to really getting into the user side of things and and and, and the business model options which I think Herman sort of touched on in his opening remarks So, um, who who wants to answer that? I think um, I think maybe Amia and Herman are uh, you closest to the current planning of of the um, project, and you, maybe you can comment also. Some of this work's been done in the DELP funded uh, project around um, you know cost benefits of of, um, of different uh, approaches. Uh, I think I can answer it partially, but I mean, you can add more clarity if you have. Uh... Uh, for the insight, but uh, so the the market mechanism I, I described uh, is an implementation of the energy management platform. That's just one implementation, but that doesn't mean that's the only implementation. So you can play around with that platform and uh, create different types of implementation. Uh, implementation. You can simulate them. You can test it out uh, on the microgrid itself. Uh, but when it when it comes to developing a concrete solution which uh, serves the need of the campus that's uh, currently i believe work in progress which will continue until next year but the real plan uh, in 2021 is to uh, develop or co-develop these uh, different use cases uh, on the temp platform and then uh, basically figure out uh, how how things go from there uh, and then uh, even if it comes to transactive market there are different types of uh, transactive markets you can implement. So that's also currently a uh, work in progress. We are working with closely with the researchers and uh, we are also looking at what everyone else is doing uh, around the world. And then uh, 
we're trying to uh, find out potential uh, collaborations there. So I, th I think that answers your question partially, uh, but when it comes to operational model and uh, for, uh, finding economic uh, foundations to this, that's pretty much work in progress. Aman, do you want to add to this? Yeah, I, I could I could add it's slightly that um, definitely there is a project ongoing uh, funded by Dell, who that, that that's trying to understand the best operating model for for this kind of thing. The, the incentives. There are also behavioral studies happening. Um, some pilots that that have, have been executed to 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 understand how how people how people will will react to, to to all to all these things, right? So so, but but I think at the end at the end, what we what we try to do with those user interaction is abstract it and reduce it to a flexibility that can be operated with the platform that Amelia is is mentioning, right? So at the end, all the all all, all that complexity in the building is translated to a flexibility that the platform ta ta takes on. Right, and and the other aspect in that is what very important that, that what Amiya is saying is that the platform will allow us to test different types of models and different types and do different types of behavioral studies. Right, so so uh, at the moment, incentives are being analyzed to see if, if that's really the way to go. Right, so it could be I've heard several discussions that maybe incentives for these people people won't really it's not the best way. Right, so 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 they yeah, have the Possibilities are, are, are endless here, and the, and the idea with the platform is that, right? So provide a, a, a platform to, to test these different, these different models, right? Terrific, thank you. Well, thanks, uh, Lauri, for the question, and Yaman and Amir for the, for the answer. I guess the, you know, we've, we've been looking at this stuff um, in, from various angles, and I guess that's really another set of projects that we need to, to activate and that may be something we can do within the race for 2030 CRC that um, some of you may know about. I think um, I'll pick up uh, one question myself here. Um, Abbas Hissan is asking about a PPA uh, and in fact uh, we've already done that and uh, we, we're effectively 55% renewable uh, 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 sort of 55 to 100, depending how you account for the certificates, uh, already uh, through the Marawara wind farm, which is, um, I think uh, we've got nine wind turbines allocated to Monash there. So uh, that that's uh, how we are going to be 100% renewable by 2030. Uh, sorry, 100% net zero. And that, that also requires switching some of our gas use to electrical. So at the moment we're actually sourcing more electricity than we need from renewable sources. Um, and that's in order to account for all the gas and other um, combustion sources we have on site that will be to electricity. Um, maybe one more question and then we'll wrap it up. Um, Kastra, is it Kastra sorry, is asking where does exactly machine learning algorithms enter the game? Is it just demand side prediction, i.e. time series demand prediction, or is there other areas that we are looking to implement machine learning in and um uh, can is anybody interested in answering that one uh i can add some uh, points here uh with machine learning now uh with the data hosting uh capability we are developing for pmu data uh we will be having some machine learning functionalities uh to uh infer the uh model of the ders and also the electric model of the network and also we are uh, using this large volume of the data we, we are planning to use machine learning to detect anomalies uh, and some event detection and classification happening in the microgrid level well, great thank you so um you know i think the broader answer is we're exploring different ways to use machine learning for various kind of smart systems uh, there's a project that's within this around using um combination of AI and uh, machine learning to, to control the buildings or to try and work out how to control the building uh, management system set points to deliver this um, this envelope that Amir talked about, uh, deliver a demand response. These buildings are incredibly complex black boxes and then they don't really respond to external stimuli very well except the stimulus of uh, temperature. So they're optimized to keep temperature for, within a certain bound. So you need to do a lot of machine learning to, to try and understand how a building will respond 
um, at least with the existing building management system technologies that are implemented, they're not really designed to be used for flexible uh, demand management. And so that's a really interesting area that uh, is quite practical. So, uh, yeah, and so any more questions, people can contact uh, the Monash Energy Institute or any of the speakers. Um, uh, the, the profiles are available on the, on the webinar uh, link, uh, which you would have seen when you signed up to this. So uh, again, please help me welcome the speakers, uh, Yolan Bulbano, Amir Dixit, Leza Razaghi, and Sarah Goodwin. And thank you everyone for attending. And uh, hopefully we'll see you uh, at the next seminar.